Welcome to Atlanta Live. I am your host tonight, Pastor Tracy Stone, and what a joy it is to come into your life and to speak the Word of God and to speak hope and strength. We have an exciting program lined up for you today, and I know these guests are going to bless you with their testimonies, with their music. We have probably one of the most um, greatest uh, music pastors and leaders in the greater Atlanta area, if not larger than that, and Jody Brazelton, a great friend of mine, and I just love his music and appreciate his heart and the style of worship that he brings will certainly bring the presence of God into your life. And some of our guests tonight, they're so gifted and talented in their own rights and what they're going to share tonight is going to bless you it's going to challenge you and it's going to make us become better than what we are right now and that's what god wants for you he wants that the rest of your life is going to be the best of your life that your best days are not behind you but your best days are in front of you so no matter what's going on in your life right now you can call out to god in fact there's a number that's on the bottom of the screen. At any time during this program, dial that number. Someone is there waiting to pray with you, to believe and speak the word of faith and agreement and touch in agreement that Jesus can change your life, that Jesus can work it out in your situation, that nothing is too hard for our God. Our God is on the throne and we see the, the storms and, of life that are physically going on, but we know this. God's in control. He's not discouraged or dismayed. He's still sitting at the right hand of the Father. He's still in control. He is tonight our everything. And we need to understand that Christ is our everything. In fact, Jody's going to lead us right now in declaring that you are my everything. Oh, come on, let's sing it now. I love to sing about it. I love to stand and shout it. I love to testify about what you have done. Come on and help me say. I love to tell my story. I love to give you glory. I love to praise you for the things that you have shown. Come on now, let's sing it together. Lord, I stand, say, Lord, I stand here in this place. Just open my heart and say, come on and say, you are my light. Yes, you are. You are my hope. You are the truest love that I've ever known. You are my peace. You are my peace. Each and every heartbeat, yes, you are. You are my Lord, you are my Lord, you are my, come on, somebody shout and say, my everything. If you believe it tonight, put your hands together and bless him, yeah. Oh, let's sing that again. Say, I love to sing about it. I love to stand and shout it. I love to testify about what you have done. Tell my story. I love to tell my story. I love to give you glory. I love to praise you for the grace that you have Oh, come on, let's sing it. Lord, I stand, say, Lord, I stand here in Open up my heart. Open my heart. And say, you are my light. Say, you are my light. Oh, you are my hope. Yes, you are. You are the truth that I've ever 
known. You are my peace. You are my, come on, say each and every heartbeat. Say you are my God. You are my God. You are my Lord. You are my life. Oh, my everything. Oh, I will bless the Lord at all times. Yes, I will. Come on, just bless him tonight. Yeah, and Lord, I stand here in this place. Oh, open my heart and say, you are my light. You are my hope. You are the truest love that I've ever known. You are my peace. Yes, you are. Oh, you are my God. You are my God. You are my Lord. You are, you are my peace. You are my each and every heartbeat. Oh, you are my God. You are my God. You are my Lord. You are my life. Yes, you are my everything. Oh, if you believe it, lift up your voice and shout it tonight. My everything. Yeah. Everybody sing and say, oh, 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 I say, oh, Lord, you're worthy of my praise. You're the Alpha, you're Omega, you're the beginning and the end. You are my strength and strong tower. You are my healer, hey, my everything. Come on, one more time, shout it out. Hallelujah. Thank you so much, Jody, for declaring you are our everything. Well, right now, I want to welcome to the set Miss and Mr. Thomas. God bless you both, Kate and Roger. What a blessing it is to have you tonight. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's a blessing to hear your story, and I can't wait for the viewing audience to get to know you and to hear your story. You're an author? Yes, I am. Um, I've written a few books, um, but Aid is Enough has traveled all around the world, actually, been passed on. And the Aid is Enough book is a story behind that. That is because you guys are... Foster adoptive parents. Of eight. Well, we adopted eight. We fostered about 50. But um, that's their story in that book, is how they came to be in our house. So how does a couple, obviously you guys are from Australia. A little yes. bit, yeah. A little bit. <laughs> yeah, I got it. I got that. So how did you guys come into the idea that we're going to be foster parents? You, I mean, something had to stir in your spirit to say, hey, this is something we want to do. Yeah, well, I didn't transition real well from Australia to here with my career and uh, because I was a professional entertainer in, in Australia and I just didn't think swapping countries at 40 was going to change a lot of my life. And I came, I tried, and then I came to the conclusion that at that particular time in my life wasn't what God wanted me to do. And Those I, doors just weren't open, were no, they? None of the doors were opening. And I did a year of really reflection. And in the end, I said to the Lord, well, if you don't want me to do what I want to do for you, what do you want me to do for you? What are you asking there me? There you go. <laughs> and we remembered we'd met a man up in the mountains when we first came here. And he told us a story of how he'd adopted this little five-year-old biracial child and it had just sat with our heart and suddenly we just knew that was what we were being called to do. I woke up the next morning, I saw a program called My Turn Now that was on the television, took down the number, rang on Monday morning. They said, you need to be in a program. Um, I, they told me where to call. I called Cobb County. Um, they said, we start tomorrow night and we have two spaces left. Wow. We thought that was a sign. 
So we... That's the sign when they're Roger. <laughs> yeah. Right there. Absolutely. And so that started the journey. That started the mm -hmm. journey. We, yeah. we said we only want to adopt kids. We don't want to be foster parents. And they said you've got to train to be a foster parent first. Okay. And uh, and so uh, we did, and it was it was great training. I was shocked. He he was wondering why we needed to train because we'd we raised four kids. We, we already had four had kids. Four kids. <laughs> so you you had it down pat. Oh yeah. yeah. After I, the fourth, remember, you were good to go. I, yeah. I remember sitting in the in the at the first session and I was being polite I was leaning back with my arms folded and then I got about 20 minutes into the first night and I went wait what and I leaned forward and, and paid attention for the rest of the you thought man I did it wrong for four <laughs> times I, 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 I didn't know a whole bunch of things well it's just very different when you get a foster child that child even if it's a baby there's a reason it's come into care and these days, um, a lot of it is drugs and alcohol. If you get a newborn baby, the, you're likely to be having to allow that child to withdraw from some of the stuff that was in you. It's, it's very sad. It's very sad. But we learned to sleep, prop ourselves up on a cushion on an angle of 45 degrees and sleep with a baby on our chest. And wow. that would go on for about three weeks, actually. It was the only way Withdrawals. Withdrawals, yeah. yeah. Oh, that had to be horrific. Um, it was, and but that's why we really advocate that if you're interested in fostering or adoption, even adoption, please go and do some training. Um, there are lots of places that train now. Uh, our church, our Grace Life Church, we're aligned with Faithbridge, which is a Christian mm -hmm. uh, foster uh, adoptive agency. And there's so many places these days that you can get excellent training and support to be a foster parent. There's a lot of kids in, out there. Oh, it's, it's even, it, it's, it's a massive It's number. massive. And because of the opioid crisis, it's worse than when we started. That is a crisis, isn't it? It, it, it is. is. It is. And I think... And kids are just kids. They yeah. just need someone to show them what to do and to help them and to love them. And if their parents are heavily addicted to drugs, they can't do that. Even if they love them, they can't do it. They can't. I believe the statistics are about six years ago, four, six years ago, we had 6,000 children in foster care in Georgia. We have 12,000 today. In Georgia alone. In yeah. Georgia. The, the meat is, and the, the and meat there's is not enough, especially Christian um, foster parents. And it's amazing because all of the children that we fostered, as well as the children we adopted, the first Thing. they were in church and they came to church with us and they were in the nursery I was in the nursery with them so even didn't matter how long they stayed with us they still were grounded and they had that experience of having God and being prayed over and um, we saw many many miracles because of that um, we've had healings huge I had one little boy that came in at 11 weeks old and I walked the floor with him all night and he was very thin, very undernourished and, and really not been bathed, etc. cetera. And uh, I walked the floor all night and I said to Roger, there's something wrong and made an appointment at the paediatrician and we had prayed over him all night because he was so upset. Well, it turned out that he had been shaken very badly and they could tell because of the scars on his um, ribs in certain places in his ribs. And when they did all the examination and they came back and they said, the shaking of this baby was so bad, we can't understand why he's perfectly normal. There's nothing wrong with him. Mm. And so we, we just prayed over all of our kids, every one of them that came in. But he was a real walking miracle. That, that is so good. Well, tell me. We've got to talk about this. Yes. Eight is eight enough. Tell us how that, what, what is eight? What does that stand for? I know, but they don't know. No, um, well, we adopted eight, but you know, when the eight, we actually had the eight because we had three sets of twins in there. So two sets came from the same biological mother. Those two sets of twins were very special needs mm -hmm. and they're only two years apart. <laughs> so um, I sort of said, I. I think eight is enough, eight is enough. And then I went, hang on a minute, I'm not sure what you're gonna do, God. If I say eight is enough, what are you gonna do? How are you going to handle this? What are you gonna do? So originally it started off, is eight enough? God knows and he ain't telling. Yeah. And the funny thing is, 
the, it, eight wasn't all. Eight was all that came from the agency. But God has sent us um, several children over the years. One we actually rescued from Liberia, that he had been dumped back on the streets of Liberia in a broken adoption. And God was so amazing in that story and bringing him back. He, he was ended up in the, in the jungle over there. Oh my. And he couldn't speak the language and he couldn't climb a coconut tree. And we eventually uh, got him back here and found that he was also uneducated. So we saw God work absolute miracles with that young man. It's, that's so, such a blessing. It was to us. It changed us. So it took you guys moving from Australia yes. to the States yes. for God to totally change your life. Totally. Well, you, now, you were serving God in Australia. Oh, yes. Of um, course. And I was writing music, yes. and, and we were ministering in, in music. I really never thought... I thought my four, my family was enough. I didn't have dreams of fostering or adoption at all. It was really a, a genuine calling from the Lord. And I, I, would, I would sense probably there's a lot of families that have a lot more questions and answers about fostering. Yes, oh, yeah. there are. And, and, and where would they go if somebody was watching or viewing this and said, you know what, I, maybe there's a nudge in my spirit. I want to be a foster parent, but mm -hmm. I really don't know where to go and I really don't know what to do. What, what would be the first step? Well, um, you can go to my website, which is theadoptionthing.org, um, and make sure you put the .org in there. Uh, and I have a lot of information on the website. There are yeah. books, there's music, there's um, free trainings that I have there, and you can go there. But other than that as well, I would really suggest that they either call their local county um, Department of Children's Services or... You know, Faith Bridge is in Georgia, mm -hmm. here in Atlanta. They have many, many um, sub-branches in different churches. They have excellent training. And they are a wonderful organization, uh, and they have amazing support. And I can't stress that enough because when you do become a foster parent, you need the support, and they have a wonderful support system. Built the in. network is, yes. is there. Absolutely. Absolutely. So this was a joint effort. Oh, yeah. So Roger, oh, yeah. Did, did the Lord, was he dealing with you at the same time he was dealing with, with your wife? Yeah, I think so. We, uh, our biological children all had different issues. One had epilepsy for a while that she grew out of, and another one was asthmatic, and another one was ADD. And it occurred to me that if anything ever happened to us, even though they were fabulous young adults, they wouldn't have been good candidates for adoption because they weren't perfect. And uh, so I was thinking about, about that and, and then uh, we saw this, we met this guy who'd adopted a, a little biracial kid and it just stirred it. And then we saw the, the ads come on TV, everything seemed to happen at once and everything opened up at once. That, that's the way God works, isn't it? It, it is. It is. It you, is. you shared, and I know you probably, we, have, we could spend the whole evening <laughs> talking about stories and yeah. you're just a delightful couple. But I want, I want you to tell very quickly the story about the kid that is yours, your daughter, and she is a ballerina. Yeah. Oh, yes, well. Tell me about that healing right can quick. I, can I tell that story? You can tell that story, I'll let you. So, I have a feeling she's going to help. <laughs> we got this, we got a call from DFAC saying, we've got this pair of babies that if they live, we need a, an experienced family to take care of them and they were born at 31 weeks, two pounds a piece. Um, addicted. Addicted to drugs. Cocaine. And I remember when the defects worker brought them to the door, one, they were both hooked up to apnea monitors. They're only about yay long. And one was hooked up to an oxygen bottle. And I remember thinking, we might have bitten off more than we could <laughs> chew here. <laughs> anyway, uh, we, we went through that. And, and the one who was hooked up to the oxygen bottle uh, was never supposed to walk. They were, they were both failure to thrive babies, never supposed to live. Mm -hmm. And when the one was really slow to walk and eventually she, the doctors told her she would never walk. And we just kept praying and doing physical therapy and eventually she got up with a walker and the doctors told her she would always need a walker. And we kept praying and doing physical therapy and eventually she threw away the walker and she had a brace. And after a while she threw away the... They said she'll always need the brace. 
And then after a while, she threw away the brace. And when they got to about five, we got them into dance as a that form of physical therapy. That she threw the brace away at five and said, I'm not wearing this anymore. And, and much to our surprise, they were really good at, the, at dancing. Oh, because then, they learned visually. And when they got to about eight, they were asked to audition for the ballet company. And you'll understand, real men like you and me, we don't cry. Sure. But sometimes there's dust in the air and it makes your eyes water and you can't help that. But I can honestly tell you that the day I saw her on point, and now they're on point. I mean, was on point amazing. And that's a testimony to God and the fact that, you know, we did what we were asked to do and he met us 100%. And she's a delightful young lady. She had speech apraxia. She was never supposed, never to, supposed talk. to talk. And I had Sometimes the most. Sometimes we wish we wish she would shut yeah. up. We, we had the most amazing speech therapist yeah. who was called Janet, and she just believed. And she said, "I'm going to I'm going to the seminar that reverses everything, and I'm going to find out how to do it." And Alexis was three and could not speak more than one or two words that she couldn't understand. And after we reversed everything, came home and started to teach her this method. She was talking in sentences in six months. That is just amazing. Uh, is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and to watch that before your very eyes, I'm telling anybody who wants to foster, you will get, you will get more. You'll be blessed more. H however much work they've been, we've got more out of it than they have. Yeah. The, the, the miracle, the yeah. testimony of the miracle yeah. is... I wanted the viewing audience tonight and today to see about what God can do oh, yeah. in the situation. Absolutely. It's astonishing. We've seen miracle after miracle with foster kids that came into foster care uh, that we prayed over and the church prayed over. We've seen um, just things disappear. Do, do you know what I mean? Things that were supposed to Heart be there. Heart defects. Heart defects. We had uh, the one that couldn't walk. Well, the sister had a heart defect, a three-pronged heart defect mm. that was healed the doctors thought from she was one to room to another. Before she was a teen. Absolutely. And, and it was healed. And she was healed at the doctor's office. Wow, at the doctor's at office? At the doctor's from, office. From one room to the next. And he could not, he looked up and he said, I have no explanation. Because he'd just seen over in the other room what the ECG had done. Yes. And now we did a sonogram and now there was nothing there. This is amazing. It you was. guys are a truly a blessing, Thank not you. only to the kingdom of God, but to these special kids. One more time, give yeah. us your website. It is theadoptionthing.org. And they can go there and find all Absolutely. the information. Lots of stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. And you have inspired me, and I know you've inspired countless many others of, well, of your inspiration to see humanity and to pour the love of Christ into it. Thank, thank you so much for coming. You. God thank bless you. you both. God thank bless. You so much. Jody's going to go now, and he's going to lead us in some worship. You are, and open up the heavens. And let's let the Lord really speak to our hearts as we've been challenged tonight to see him in a special way. Come on, let's worship him in this building tonight. All that are watching, let's just lift up our hands and just tell it that I You are the love of my life. You are the hope that I cling to. You mean more than this world to me. silver or gold I would trade you for rich hands I'm told cause you are you are my everything I would take one step I could never go long. I could live one day without you. See, I don't have the strength to make it on my own. You are the love of my life. Oh! 
sing. Yes, you are. Oh, until the world stops turning. Oh, until the stars fade from the sky. Until the sun stops rising. I need you in my life, and here's the reason why you are the love of my life. Lord, you are the hope that I cling to. You mean more than this world. He's our everything. And Lord, we pray tonight that you open up the heavens, Lord, all around our lives. Lord, we need more of you and less of us. Come on at home, will you put your hands together right now and just begin to worship? We've waited for this day. We've gathered in your name calling out to you your glory like a fire awakening desire burns our heart with truth see you're the reason we're here come on tell it say you're the reason we're singing say open up the heavens we want to see you open up the floodgates a mighty river flowing from your heart feeling every part of our praise yeah presence in this place your glory on our face we're looking to the sky Sending like a cloud, you're standing with us now. Lord, unveil our eyes. See, you're the reason we're here. Oh, you're the reason we're singing. Yeah. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river. Flowing from your heart, feeling every part of our prayer. Oh, we sing, say, open up the heavens. We want to see you open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart, feeling every part of our prayer. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Oh, if that's your prayer, lift your voice with me and say, Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us. Show us your glory, Lord. Come on, lift your hands with me in the worship. Lord, we bless. 
bless your name. Oh, come on. He's worthy of a praise. Come on, right where you're sitting, just begin to cry out to him and sing. Everybody sing, say, open up the heavens. We want to see you open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart. Feeling every part of our praise. Everybody say, open up the heavens. We want to see you open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart. Feeling every part of our praise. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise God, Jody. Thank you so much. Pour out. Open up the heavens tonight. That number's on the screen. Dial that number. Let somebody agree with you that the presence and the power of God can flood your home, flood your life, and touch you in a special way. We have tonight with us probably one of the most influential men that's of late that's come into my life. I count him a friend, a brother, a mentor, a true man of God. His name is Brother Paul. Brother Paul, thank you so much. Good to be here. I'm telling yes. you, it's a delight to yeah. have you, and you're just an inspiration. Yeah. Well, I tell you, I just love being with you. I really do. Yeah. We've had a lot of good times together, you know. Yeah. And uh, just to see God move in people's lives has been absolutely phenomenal. I, I feel like, what, what is a country redneck like me doing all these people from down under? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to speak like you guys. I do. I slaughter the English language as it is. I think we're the ones that slaughter the English language. <laughs> At any rate, we're doing. We're glad to have you, mm. and you. You have traveled the world mm. as an evangelist, mm -hmm. as a missionary, yeah, yeah. as a pastor. Yeah. Tell us about some of the, just who you are and what you've done, and bring us up to date. Well, I was an Australian. I was a youth pastor. Yeah. And. Uh, found myself offered a foreign student scholarship to come to America. And I can tell you, I've been very grateful that America did that to us. And we came to America over 40 years ago. And uh, so we uh, always planned to go back. And then I uh, got myself educated mm -hmm. and I couldn't read a map to go home again. Yeah. <laughs> so we stayed in America pastoring and we had actually uh, gone to a, uh, we were just driving through California and there was a, uh, a uh, church, uh, I knew the pastor in Australia years ago, and he just lost his youth pastor, and he uh, had fired him, actually, and I had my first Wednesday night just to help him out for three weeks, had five miserable, angry kids, and uh, I was only staying for three weeks, uh, and then heading to Texas to go to graduate school, and all of a sudden, God started moving, and we started getting kids coming off drugs and moving, uh, coming, flowing in God. It was wonderful. We had kids living in our home. We had and within a matter of three months, we had 100 kids. And then it went up to 300 kids. And it was just absolutely phenomenal move of God that took place. And that kind of put us in America to stay at that point. And then we pastored and then traveled overseas. And, um, and then part of my life you may not be that familiar with, I uh, uh, became a marriage and family therapist and got into uh, uh, private practice as well as uh, conference speaking. And, and I had found a lot of uh, people men that, uh, that are emotionally shut down. And uh, when they're home with their families, they, you know, there's no emotion. They just, they, they can think intellectually, they uh, begin to strength and being strong and healthy. But uh, in, in Atlanta particularly, so many men don't, never had a father at home. And if they did, he was an angry father or he was an alcoholic. And so we got men growing up, never been mentored. And uh, I'll not forget uh, my little boy was six at the time. We were putting the boat in the water, and he banged his knee on the uh, tow hitch of the of the of the uh, boat, oh. and he uh, started to cry. And there's a guy alongside putting his boat in the water and said, "Hey, don't cry, be a man, kid." And and young boys have been taught not to cry. They've been taught not to feel. And so what ends up happening is they don't feel. Yes. 
And uh, so when they get married, they don't know how to raise their own sons. And no one has taught these young men. They had no dads in the home, so dad was angry. And no, how in the world are they going to be taught to be a man? Now, girls t uh, are different to guys. If, if a girl is hurting, she talks to her girlfriends about it or she talks to mom about it. But who does a guy go to? Uh, most guys, you know, if you're hurting, somebody grabs you on the shoulder and says, uh, oh, it'll be right, mate. You'll be okay. And that's about the best we ever get from anybody. And so we never learn to ever emotionally get connected. So what ends up happening is we've got these men growing up who don't know how to be a man. No one ever taught them. Mm. Tragic, isn't it? It's terrible. Yeah. Terrible. But it is the epidemic of today. Yeah, and they don't know how to feel. And you ask a man, most men that's, uh, that's disconnected like that, you ask, what are you feeling? Well, I feel frustrated and I feel angry and I feel sad. It's about the only three feelings they ever feel. And not frustrated, a, angry, and sad. Sad. And that's the only feelings they feel. And uh, part of that journey was my own journey. Because I can recall one day I'd got angry at home and jumped in the, in the van and gone down to the office, and I was just really angry. And when I got down to the office, I sat thinking about it and thought, you know, I'm not angry, I'm hurt. I was that so was excited. I, yeah, I raced home to talk to my wife then and to tell her, I, I'm not angry with you, I'm just hurt. It was a whole new feeling for me. And what ends up happening is guys that can't experience feeling, they end up stuffing the feeling. They're taught you don't feel, boys don't cry, boys don't get upset, you know, get, 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 get a, uh, a grip on things. And they're never taught how to feel. And because they had to find their own way in manhood and no one there to show them, they grow up feeling very insecure and they put this hard exterior on. So what ends up happening is they can think intellectually, they can arm wrestle anybody, Mm -hmm. They can do anything physically, so they're very good sexually. But emotional love and romance is not part of their life because they've never learned to feel emotionally. So they end up stuffing everything inside, and they're taught to stuff. Don't feel. Stuff it inside. So what ends up happening is this part, the emotional part of our being, and we're really three-part emotional, or three-part of our being. We are an intellectual being, besides being a spiritual being, and then we got a physical being, but there's also the emotional side of us as well. And they just don't feel, so they keep stuffing it inside. Now, what ends up happening, these grown to men. And if you dare try to puncture that emotional side of them, they're going to get angry. It takes a lot of energy to keep that emotion locked up inside of you. And it gets very, very exhausting. And if anybody tries to get inside, they'll get angry and self-protect. And so we find somebody once wrote a book and said, I think it's Larry Crabb wrote the book and said, our greatest sin as Christians is self-protection. Mm. And what ends up happening when you're like that and you've got all this junk inside that you can never talk about, never think about, never deal with, you start getting into self-protection mode. Mm. So you can never be wrong. You always stay in denial. And you always have to keep an edge on you. And you get exhausted with just trying to keep your emotions together. So what ends up happening, you can't let anybody close. You cannot let a wife close. You can get close physically, but you can't get close emotionally. Because if you do, you have to let your wife into here. You have to let yourself into there. And you can't go into this mass. And as you get older, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And when I was going through that, I uh, found that uh, I'd wake out of bed angry in the morning. Well, what's wrong? What's going wrong with me? I was a pastor. As a matter of fact, I did a pastor's conference, and they asked me to speak on the angry man and the wounded man, and I spoke on that. And it went on for a couple of hours. They had to break the whole conference up because all the pastors were at the altar seeking God because of the woundedness that they'd received as a child and never dealt with mm -hmm. the things inside. Pretty tragic. And so I had to, in my own personal life, I had to learn how to feel. Now, some folks say, take a journal, start to journal your feelings down. I wasn't that kind of a person at the time. But I have to sit there and I'd think about, what am I feeling? And I'd try to put a name to it. I started reading about feelings. So until I began to realize I'm more than frustrated. You know, I'm happy. I'm joyful. And began to understand what I needed to have. Now, if you were to ask me tonight and say, well, how does a man get over that? The first thing is, those that hurt you, you have to forgive them. That's almost impossible for yeah. most men. Yeah, it is, isn't it?
It really is. They're not going to, because forgiveness, they equate to weakness. Weakness. And if you do, the pain was so great that tomorrow morning, you'll still feel angry again. Mm -hmm. A little bit like peeling an onion. Yeah. You know, you, got, you peel the first layer off and you feel great. Yeah. You go to the altar at church or something and you say, God, I just forgive that person who w w wounded me. And tomorrow morning, it's back there again. And so it's learning to uh, keep going back, asking God for forgiveness until it takes hold in your own spirit. And when that does, you start to find healing. And what's key is that to recognize the person that hurts you may have been harsh, may have been angry, may have been an alcoholic, but they were wounded. And they lashed out out of their and woundedness. Out of their woundedness. And if you can see them no longer as a monster or whatever they might be, but see them as a wounded human being as we are, mm -hmm. we're able to say, God, I forgive them because out of their wounds, they wounded me. And one of the first steps is to come to that place of forgiveness. Mm. And then to start to think feelings and talk feelings. Because you see what ends up happening, Pastor, is if you don't do it you're, and you're raising a son, you're raising the same way you were raised. True. Sure. He'll grow up without any feelings because you, you haven't let him come in. So it really is a real challenge in the church. And I've found it, you know, you and I have been at the altar many times working together and how many men that I deal with on a Sunday, you know, and just praying with them and, and recognizing that they're wounded and somebody wounded them and they come to the place of forgiveness. And I found for me personally, it took me a long time to come to that place of forgiveness because the wounds had gone that deep. But I kept doing it, kept peeling the onion until I began to do that. And then what ends up happening is when, when you let the wall down, you don't have to be angry anymore. And some of you wives out there, you say, boy, my husband is so angry because he has put this wall around him and he thinks if you get inside, he's going to fall apart. Can't let anybody, can't even let himself inside. Mm -hmm. And that's the tragedy. And I'll not forget that uh, I told you about this one time before I was driving on the freeway in Los Angeles. And Lloyd Ogilvie was the pastor of North Hollywood Presbyterian Church. And he said, let God love you. And I got mad. I was a, a preacher. I said, of course God loves me. Took me some weeks of hearing him just say that last line on his broadcast every Monday, that I loved God and knew that God loved me, but was I letting God love me? Hmm. That was the big difference. Do I let my wife love me? Do I let my kids in to love me? Because if I don't, I'm going to have to keep that hard shell around me, and they're going to, go, going to grow up feeling abandoned and neglected inside. Quite a challenge, isn't it? It's huge. Huge, isn't it? Yeah. To deal with the stuff that we, the bottledness. Yeah. yeah. I, I just love to hear you share and speak and to pour in because as a pastor, it's, it's challenging to me to see mothers drag their kids without their husbands. Without their husbands, yeah. And... You, they're at home or they're absent or they're struggling. Yeah. And I know probably, without a doubt, it's not probably, there are countless people watching tonight with mm. bottled stuff. Bottled stuff, yeah. As a matter of fact, in seminars, when I've done seminars over the years, I have women come up and say, that's me. So it's not just a male thing, it's predominantly in the male community, but mm -hmm. there are some girls that grew up to learn to shut their feelings down. And when there's a lot of anger in the home, it's, uh, it starts to cause the children to shut down. And they'll, they'll raise the children themselves that are shut down and not emotionally connected. And then the family unit breaks apart. Right, yeah. And thus we have divorce. Right, absolutely, yeah. And so they go into the next relationship thinking, well, I'll start over, and it's the same thing all over again. Mm -hmm. It is, yeah. Because it's on the inside. It's on the inside. So what's the first step? First, it really is to come to a place of recognizing the person that damaged you was wounded goods themselves. Okay. And if you can recognize the reason why they did that, because they're carrying some real hurt. I can think of a man right now that was in, uh, in Desert Storm and then Afghanistan, and he's 55 years of age. He's dying of cirrhosis of the liver. 
He's a very angry man. Matter of fact, we led him to Christ about six weeks ago. And uh, he, he's done some real damage in his life, even to his own young people, his own children. And uh, because of his own anger and of his alcoholism, he hasn't realized he's damaged them. And the first step is to realize that, hey, we can't blame that person. They were wounded. They were damaged. We may never know the extent of the damage, but can we hold them to account now as their son or their daughter because they were wounded? Mm. And when you start going into their life and realizing that, it's much easier to come to that place of forgiveness and just keep saying, Lord, I forgive them for what they did to me. It doesn't mean they're not responsible for what they did, but I can forgive them. And I would go back every day and keep crying that prayer of forgiveness until one day it took hold. That, and it happened just like that. It began to happen like that. Well, Brother Paul, thank you so much for sharing out of your heart. And if you're listening and watching and you're dealing with hurt, you're dealing with pain, you're dealing with unforgiveness, uh, why don't you dial that number on the screen? Let a prayer partner agree with you mm. that you too can find freedom. There, there's a freedom that comes when you release it mm. and when you let it go. My cousin wrote a great book, and it says, Forgiving the Unforgivable. Mm. And in that book, he talks about letting go. And that's a powerful thing is when you let go of the offense. Psalms 119, 165 says, Great peace have they which loves his law, and nothing shall offend them. Nothing. I looked the word up, Brother Paul, in the Hebrew, what nothing means. You know what it means? Nothing. <laughs> it just means nothing. Nothing. Yeah. No matter what anybody says or does yes. can offend you. God's grace and God's mercy can touch you. In fact, right now, we're going to go into the studio to the phones, and we're going to let someone pray with you, instruct you even further in how to connect with God and how to connect with them to move forward in Christ. Let's go now to, the, to that to the phones. God bless you. Good evening and welcome to the TV 57 prayer room. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and what? Be glad. We are boasting on the Lord tonight. We are magnifying him because of who he is. We're just having an exciting time here in the prayer room. We've had many people call in for prayer, for family, for children, for finances, and we are here to stand in the gap for you. If you have not received Christ as your personal Savior, give us a call, and we'll walk you through the prayer of salvation. We have, my name my name is Evangelist Glory Dixon. I'm one of the associate minister, ministers of the Beulah Missionary Baptist Church under Pastor Jerry D. Black in Decatur, Georgia. And we have some of the other associate ministers from Beulah, as well as Sister Carolyn Hood from The Way, and her pastor is Pastor Prince Williams. Yes, yokes are being destroyed here. People are being healed and delivered and set free. All you have to do is have the faith. The word says that without faith it is impossible to please God and if you need to be healed come on call come on in call us cause and we will pray for you just remember that doctors have the medicine but God has the power yes. and we we are going to pray God's power on your life for your healing, for you to be delivered and set free. And we're going to pray for your home, your household, your husband, your spouses, your children. Just We're just going to pray for everything. And that's what we're here for. Even our entire church is praying tonight. Just to, Not just the people you see here, but our entire church knew we, we would be manning the phones tonight. And they are praying because one can put a thousand to flight. Two can put 10,000 to flight. And we are powerful yeah. in numbers. We are powerful to intercede for you, to intercede on your behalf. So we're waiting. All we need is you. Yeah. So give us a call. And we're going to help you destroy those yokes. Now let's go back to the studio. Well, hallelujah. Thank you so much for leading us in prayer and instructing us. God bless you. Well, we have with us now Jody Brazelton. Jody, God bless you. God Man, bless you've been you. singing up a storm tonight. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. 
You've yeah. been blessing our hearts. The interviews were awesome. They, yeah. Everybody has been so on task and on target for what God's using them for and ministering to people. Let's talk about an event that you and I, we've been doing this for probably a little over a year now. Yeah. We've been traveling around doing what we call live at five. Yeah. Evangelistic meetings at five o'clock. We've been flying all over the country doing them. Yep. Uh, we've been seeing miracles and healings. Yep. Amazing stuff. It's been great. It's really been great. I mean, we just been by faith. You know, we go into these churches, and uh, I remember when you talk about that. I remember just a few months back when we were. I forget where we were exactly, but it was. It was. I remember it because of the bad storm that we flew back on, but. Um, we were at a Baptist church in Wake Forest, yes, North Carolina. Yes, and the man that, that was deaf in one ear. Yeah. I remember being on the stage and when his ear popped open, seeing the look on his face. It was pretty remarkable. If you've never seen, and I've seen healings before, but that's the first time I've seen somebody that, that couldn't hear be able to instantly heal or yeah. hear like that. Yeah, and we're in the process right now of a live at five. We've got two more Sunday afternoons at five in uh, Jonesboro. Yep. Georgia and McDonough, Georgia, rather. On Jonesboro Road, it's I on believe. It's on Jonesboro Road. There it is on the screen. Yeah. And we'd love to have you to come and be a part of it. You're going to be seeing yeah, the ministry team will be there. We're going to be laying hands on the sick, yep. praying for them, prophesying, believing God. It's going to be great. It ain't going to just be me singing. Your your wife's going to be there singing too. The whole ministry Lisa team. Stone. We've got Chris and, and Nina. Nita Daigle. Yep. Nita they're Daigle. Gonna they're going to be there singing. Yeah, it's that's going to be great. It's going to be a we song fest. We all night. I'm telling you, I'm ready. It starts at 5 p.m. and um, seats and admissions free. And you, normally you'd, you'd have to pay for some kind of the concert like you're going to hear. Yeah, and it's just going to be great. We're just going to we're just going to invite the presence of God to flow through the place, and we don't know what's going to happen. We plan some songs, but usually when we do that, God shows up and. Something totally different. Yeah, it's great. I, you know, and I, I think, aren't you at our church on Sunday leading worship? I believe we've we've, we've decided worked, that's yeah, what's going to happen. That's right. He's going to be at Praise Community Church on <laughs> Sunday, leading worship and and taking us to the throne room of God. But I I just wanted to bring you on the, the set and let's talk just a minute because as we are speaking right now and even tomorrow morning when it airs again, uh, my home state North Carolina is being destroyed. Uh, the coastline, the the storm that Florence is is pounding the coast right now, yeah. and we want to lift those families up in prayer, and and let them know that we here in Atlanta are believing God for them, yeah. that yeah. there's hope and there's help. In fact, we're already gathering product out of our churchyard in yeah. a 53 foot trailer. Absolutely, we're a drop off site for Red Cross and for anybody that wants to drop off. We're taking water and baby formula and anything that of that nature to to the region because the horrific damage. We remember what happened with Harvey. Yeah, and it's going to be catastrophic flooding and you know we go through times like that. I know people that maybe aren't as strong in the faith, they question God. Yeah. Why, why does this happen? Mm -hmm. you, know, um, you know, some things are just, just that. They're things. It's nature. Right. And, and things happen. And um, people go through it. And what we have to do is realize that God's grace and His mercy That's right. is sufficient yeah. to get us through the trial. And He uses individuals to help people through the trial. There's an organization uh, called God's Pit Crew. God's Pit Crew is a tremendous organization. Their website is godspitcrew.org. That's Randy Johnson. That's the founder of God's Pit Crew. I serve as the vice chair on the board of directors for God's Pit Crew. And, and more than that, I'm just a volunteer. I love to volunteer. Yeah. But God spoke to him in an altar in 1999, Jody, about responding to a storm. And you saw in that picture the tractor trailers. They didn't have all of that then. Yeah. But now the product goes in for free. The help goes for free. Trees cut off houses, uh, rebuild homes, um, people partnering with the ministry. People like Joyce Meyer yeah. has partnered. Uh, people like Pastor Jensen Franklin at Free Chapel has partnered. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jonathan Falwell sits on the board with me. Oh, that's great. Uh, it's, it's amazing. The pastor, I, he, his name escapes me. He's a great friend, and I, I don't see him, but at the board meetings, he pastors Brooklyn Tab. 
um, ah, I can't remember his name. Lord help me. My, Cynthia or something like that. Something like that. Yes. Jim, I think. Jim, yes. Yeah, it's him. Pastor right. Jim. And Jim is um, serving on the board as well. So there's a lot of people that are, are kingdom recognized as great leaders that are supporting and a partner with God's pit crew. And I urge you to go to their website, visit and see, see what's going on. But as we move forward throughout this program, let us do so with the mindset that we're going to pray. We're going to pray for those that are going through the storm, that are going through the, the floods and the rains even right now. It's my home state. My heart's yeah, breaking. Absolutely. I, I mean, I have family there that are going through this, this, and I, I just want God to protect them. Amen. And I know that God will do that. And we want to, again, uh, remind you about Sunday, and I believe that miracles are going to take place. It's going to be a great day. I'm looking forward to it. We're all excited about it. It, it is good, isn't it? It is. Absolutely, it is. It's great. And when people are healed and blind eyes are open, we, we hear about that stuff, but we're actually seeing it. Absolutely. I've seen it. I I've know what seen happens. It. I've seen it. I don't it. have to ask somebody's opinion. I know what happens because I've seen it. We, we all have. So Just a few days ago, we had a lady that was um, with a walker, totally healed, left the, left the church. I saw her in the parking lot, toting her walker in her hand, going back to her car. I'm like, well, there I guess she's just going to keep it. I but she that. certainly didn't need it. I know, hanging on the wall. Yeah, that's a reminder of what God's done. I've, I've held in my hands, literally, I've held hearing aids where people have pulled them out and said, we're believing, and watched God open up their ears. Yeah. One of the greatest stories, I'll tell you real quick, we had a guy that was had a ear damage and everything in his ear was gone. He had no eardrum, no anything. And I know that sounds unbelievable about what I'm fixing to tell you. And had I not seen it, I wouldn't believed it. But John was his name. John hears out of an ear with no eardrum, no internal anything. How does that happen? That just has to be supernatural. I don't know how that yeah. happens. I, I don't have an answer for that. Right. Other than it's a miracle. We serve a God of miracles. The numbers on the screen there's a miracle for you. God, he's no respecter of person. He'll do for you what he did for them. Yeah. Believe, have faith in the Lord. Don't doubt in your heart. Speak to the mountain and the mountain will be removed. God is for you. He's not against That's you. You right. understand that? He is for you. He is not against you. God bless you. We'll see you real soon. Have a great time.
Well, welcome back to Atlanta Live. Once again, I am your host, Pastor Tracy Stone, and I am so delighted that you've chosen to join with us to worship the Lord in song and to hear some inspiring testimony. We have a special guest that in this segment, you're going to be blessed by his testimony and what God is using him to do for the kingdom of God and touch and change lives. I do want to remind you that the number that's on the screen, there are people waiting, waiting to agree and pray and speak the word of God and pour the love of Jesus into you through prayer and to speak faith into your life, that your life can change and that greater days are ahead and that life doesn't have to stay stagnant, but you can move forward in Christ. And in just a moment, Jody Brazelton, he's going to come again and lead us in worship and he's going to touch our hearts with a wonderful song. I believe he actually wrote this particular song. It is entitled Holy and Acceptable. Lead us, Brother Jody. That's my prayer tonight, Lord, that I 
want to be just like you, Jesus. I want to live just like you. Sit my body as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable. Come on, just lift up your hands in your living room right now. And just worship him and say, Hallelujah. Thank you so much, Jody. Thank you for reminding us of that promise and that truth from God's Word. God bless you so much. Well, tonight we have Greg Washington. Yes, God sir. bless you, my friend. All right. Thank you, Pastor Tracy. God bless, bless you. It's just a, a delight to get to meet you today and to yes. hear your testimony and what God's using you yes. to do one of the most inspirational things that... Um, uh, I believe anybody could be doing right now is, is touching the men the way you're going to minister to them. Yes. Tell us what you're doing. Well, Pastor Tracy, first of all, I just want to give honor to God, man, yes. because he's, he's so good. Uh, I don't deserve to be here sitting with you because I haven't always been on the right side of the track. Uh, my story is I came to City of Refuge in 2006 after being released from a 20-year sentence for trafficking cocaine. I was the Tobias in the book of Nehemiah that brought about destruction to that community. And God just has a sense of humor because he placed me right there at City of Refuge to work with some great people to do some kingdom work. So I'm so honored because God chose me. He pulled me out of the miry clay. He pulled me out of my, my own mess and he turned my mess into my message. So I just want to tell you, I'm so honored to be on your show and um, just to be able to represent City of Refuge, uh, which our CEO is Bruce Deal. Uh, I met Bruce in 2006, uh, went on a men's retreat, and I remember him asking me the same question you just asked me, what is your story? So I went and told him my story. Um, in 1993, I hit a pole doing 120 miles an hour, blew out my right kneecap. Uh, my life was going that fast. My life was just propelling out of control. And uh, I came to know Jesus, man. In 2001, I gave my life to Christ. And then my journey started in prison. And uh, God blessed me. And I, I didn't have to serve the 20 years. I wound up paroling out in five years. And I came over to City of Refuge just as a volunteer. Uh, I was there, helped serving the men's ministry we were going to, doing street feeds. And uh, God just started working on my heart. And in 2009, Bruce offered me the youth pastor position. So for the last eight years, I've been the youth program director working with kids. And I was just listening to Pastor Paul because a lot of the kids in my youth ministry, uh, me and my wife, Malika, man, I can't do anything without her, you know, because she support me so much. And uh, we had kids calling us mom and dad. And uh, for eight years, you know, we did great work. Um, working with kids that's in crisis, because at City Refuge, you know, we have a women and children ministry called Eden Village, which house our women and children um, that find themselves in crisis. It's a 120-day program, and we got a chance to minister to a lot of the kids that just didn't have parents, good parents in their life, good decision-making wasn't happening. And uh, June of this year, Bruce brought me in the office and said, I think I got a new task for you. Uh, I think I want you to lead uh, re-entry ministry here at City of Refuge. So I was blessed to fly out to Ohio uh, to train up under Ron and Kathy Torino, who wrote a great program called Tyro. Tyro is a Latin word for a novice, apprentice, someone learning something new, 
a warrior. And uh, the Tyro DAS program is all in Ohio. They're in like 23 different institutions in Ohio where they're uh, ministering to men, uh, bringing back reconciliation to the family. So I'm blessed to be able now here in Atlanta at the Metro Reentry Center, I do Tyro DAS. I just graduated my first cohort of 12 men. That's well, awesome. Yes. So we take them through this eight weeks of great uh, curriculum and we, we have them to write letters, we have them to tell their story, uh, have them to own up to um, what they were in there for so when they come out back into the community they can be greater fathers and greater men for our community. And so you're connecting, you're, you're hands on, so these guys, they've been paroled and they're out and your job is to train them and disciple them so they don't go back. Yes, yes, so we get a chance to use uh, I'm in two days a week uh, with guys that's paroling out 12 to 18 months, and we get the chance to take them through the Tyro curriculum. That's before they get out. That's before they get out, because the whole thing is a wraparound program. They'll be coming to City of Refuge to get some of our service. We have a Napa Automotive training program. We have a culinary arts training program. Because what we want to do is strengthen the man. So we can strengthen him by giving him vocational skills. We have a bunch of vocation right there at City of Refuge. So the plan is I go in, build relationship, build fellowship with these guys. And when they come out, we'll welcome them into our community, back into the community so we can help them. And uh, we just got a, a bunch of great partnerships. Um, we work with Prison Fellowship. They have a ministry called uh, Offenders Alumni Association. We meet every Tuesday night at City of Refuge to give people support that's coming back into the community because, you know, the Georgia Department of Correction are, is redoing a lot of their, their, their lingo. They call them returning citizens. Uh, I was once a returning citizen and just had someone there to welcome me and that was City of Refuge. So I'm being able to be the hand and feet of God for these same men and their families. Tell us what some people may or may not know what City of, I know what City of Refuge okay. is. But someone listening or watching and viewing may not know what City of Refuge is. So City of Refuge is a faith-based nonprofit that was founded uh, 21 years ago by Bruce and um, Rhonda Deal. Mm -hmm. uh, they came down, just quick story, they came down to 14th Street to close a small church and out of that City Refuge was birthed. Um, they found the building over at the 1300 block. We are right in the, the heart of the city, the 30314 zip code, one of the toughest zip codes in Atlanta. And we have 250,000 square foot of warehouse space where every inch of that warehouse space is used for some form of uh, bringing light, hope, and transformation. So we, we call it a one-stop one shop for somebody that's in crisis. Uh, you have Eden Village, which is our residential program for women and children. We have the House of Chair, which we tackle the, the sex trafficking that's going on in our, our nation right now. We're able to house women that, that are uh, victims of exploitation. We have our Napa Automotive Training Center there. We have a 180 degree culinary arts training program there. We have great partners on site like Mercy Care, um, Bright Features Atlanta. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's a place to see, man. You, you come there, it's just a lot of ministry going on, uh, bringing light, hope, and transformation to those that are in crisis. That's City of Refuge. That's City of Refuge. And so now you're, you're now no longer the youth pastor. No longer the youth pastor. You are now the connect, call me the, tell me that title so, again. <laughs> so I'm the reentry um, director for the Tyro program. Uh, so we use this Tyro program to go into the, to the prisons, to minister to the men, uh, to make great relationship with them so they can come out and use the resources that we have at City of Refuge. I can tell you as, as a pastor, one of the most horrific eye-opening things for me was when I was asked to go speak at the prison. Mm. I've, I've been there many times. And, right. And down in Macon. Okay. I've, it's a pretty secure place. Yes, There's it a lot is. of a lot of fellas done a lot of things in that room. Yes, sir. And um, it's very surreal when they shut the door. Yes. And you're now in a new territory. Yes. Yes. And that's the environment. And uh, it's, it's as much as society tries to rehabilitate people. Right. Nobody can rehabilitate like Jesus. No. And we watch him come in to the, I guess it's the gymnasium or the hall there where we yes. would, would speak. And, 
you know, the room would fill because it'd right. be like a revival type night when we would go and the room would be filled. And what struck me as horrific is, and, but yet eye opening is when we gave the altar call, mm -hmm. over 80% of those men wow. got out of their seat, wow. came down to the front and gave their heart to Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. So the horrific part of that for me was, is that we have a culture mm -hmm. that is lost. I mean, you know, and some people don't want to deal with people because they think people are disposable. Right. That's one of the worst things about society is we think people are disposable. Yes. It breaks my heart. Yes. Because it doesn't matter what anybody's done. Right. The grace of Jesus can pick them up. Right. 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 And and that's. I mean, you're 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 a living testimony. Yes, I'm a testimony of it. I've been blessed, man, because uh, last year. Uh, I was blessed with a full pardon. Uh, God, come just, on, man! <laughs> Praise the in God, good. God is just good, man. He 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 have brought my life full circle, so I'm able to uh, be a change agent for me, and I'm able to tell them if you come out and you live man, your life for the Lord, heart. yeah, it's it. So it's all because of Jesus, man. It's all because He seemed fit to uh, just save me, bring me out of my mess, and uh, turn my mess into my message. And I'm, I'm so grateful for that. Well, I'm and thankful that God's using you on the backside. Yes. But let's just take a few minutes okay. and talk to the mom, the dad that's dealing with the kid yes. that's on the front side. Yes. And it's just a matter of time before yes. it becomes reality for them. Yes. What would you speak to that parent that's dealing with that kid? Because you weren't with that kid. Yes. You were that kid. Yes. What, what could have reached you before? Well, you know, when I think about it, and uh, I'm a part of uh, a mentoring program mm -hmm. now to fatherless boys uh, yeah. it's called Building Your Legacy. And uh, I understand the fact, like I was listening to Pastor Paul, that uh, men have been extracted out of the home. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need more men to stand in the gap. Uh, at that time, you know, my mom was married to my father, but, you know, he was in the military. He had his own personal issues, so he wasn't in the home. So I didn't grow up with uh, um, uh, the father figure that I needed. And if, if anything, you know, and I believe, man, God gave me a message in 2005, and it was to the men. And he told me to just tell the men, get back in the household so you can cover the kids. And uh, I'm blessed to be able to be married 10 years now. And, you know, when me and my wife got married, we both had two kids, and then we had a kid together. And we believe we're breaking the generational curse that was placed on our family with not, you know, having mom and dad. So um, I just, my message is always back to the men, you know, get back into the home, uh, cover, the, cover those kids, uh, be a father to those kids. How, how much more is going to have to happen? in our society before the men step up? Man, I don't know. I mean, we're we, we at a crisis we're right all, now. We, we, I, we keep saying we're at a crisis, and we, we were saying this five years ago. Right. I was sitting with pastors. We were talking about it. We're at a crisis, and here we are five years later, and here me and Brother Greg, we're yeah. sitting here again. We're at a crisis. We're at a crisis. It, 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 I get so stirred up about this because I know that I come, I come from a different aspect than you do. Right. I came from a, a father, a home where my father was very much active right. in my life. Right. He was very much influential, not only socially, but spiritually. Right. Who taught me the ways of God, taught me how to be a good father right. by being an example. Right. He drug me to the woods to pray. Wow. You know, and my whole family, I mean, we watched our dad pray and Never. I, my dad and both of my parents have passed, but I don't ever remember my father ever, mm. ever mm. raising his voice at my mom. Wow. Ever. I'm sure they had arguments. Right. But I never heard it one time. Yeah. Not once. Yep. So, Pastor Trace, we just have to stand in the gap, man. We have to stand in the gap for those men and today able to get into their rightful place. We have to stand in the gap. We have to be the examples. We have to be the mentors. We have to be the men of God in their life as an example. As a pastor. As a pastor. I'm sure there's pastors and, and leaders of churches watching. Initially, what can pastors do other than, okay, we're going to provide ministry to men? Well, I mean, challenge. I mean, 
right. speak something into our hearts tonight that would challenge pastors and we can, because I don't want to just talk about it. Right. I want to do something about right. it. Right, right. Well, one thing I do know is we have to welcome, I believe God is raising up a remnant of men that are incarcerated. And, you know, City Refuge gave me a platform to reinvest and reinvent myself to be a man worth following, to, to get, uh, you know, the right reputation, to be a man of integrity, a man of degradation. So I would challenge pastors to, to look for those men, look for those uh, Joshua's that they can mentor and bring along and, and, and raise them up so they'll be uh, great for their families and then they'll go back and they'll raise some more men up. And uh, I just believe Jesus had the best discipleship model. You know, he picked 12. You know, so I think if, as men, if we can go get 12 men and disciple them and bring them, and I think we can multiply that. And, and to challenge, and you know, while we're sitting here talking, I'm thinking of ministries, and, and I am blessed as a pastor to have people like Pastor Paul right. working along beside us, ministering to men at right. our church, and right. great other ministries in our church, touching men's lives in a special way, but I do want to do more. Yes. I'm, I'm, we're the same age, basically, and right. I'm, I'm looking at life. I, you know, I want, I want to look, start looking backwards and start pouring, leaving a legacy and, right. and pouring something into the next generation. Right. That I want the rest of my life to make a difference. Yes. I want yes. the kids to experience it. And you, I just applaud what you're doing and, the grace of God that's in your life and what yeah. God's done for you. Right. And and what he's done for your family. And yeah. it's, it's just a miracle to see God do that in your life. And yes, it is. I'm a miracle. <laughs> you are a miracle. I mean, number one, you survived a, a telephone pole. Yeah. At 100, 100 and how much? 130 miles an hour. And lived to tell about it. Lived to tell about it. Busted your leg. but B Busted my right kneecap. I, 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 I was diffused right now. So I have a, a six-inch rod from my from my ankle all the way to my to my uh, to my ankle from my it's waist. A constant today. reminder. Constant reminder. I, I feel like Don't Jacob. Let it go. <laughs> yeah, I feel like Jacob. I wrestled with God. <laughs> <laughs> he was get, trying to get you, but you wouldn't. You wouldn't go. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he yep. got you. He got me. And what a blessing! What a blessing to the kingdom of God you are. Yes. What a blessing to this ministry of city of refuge to yes. speak to these people and is there a website that people can go to? Yes, you can just hashtag city of refuge atl.org. You can just go to our website and you can kind of see all the great programs we have, the great partnerships. Uh, yeah, it's just uh, there hashtag, it is on the screen. Yep, city of refuge atl.org. That's, That's it. it and people can connect. And they can connect, they can volunteer, they can, you know, they can come be a part. You know, we have launched this new campaign, I am, we are. So you are a city of refuge. Sure. Uh, wherever you at, you're a place of refuge for those in need. Man, that's a blessing. I want to tell you, thank you so much yes, for sir. being here tonight. Thank you, Pastor. And blessing our hearts and blessing us. And I want to encourage you to use that website, that hashtag, and log on and, and connect with this great ministry. I believe it will be a blessing. And any time throughout while Jody's singing, connect with us through um, the phones that are people waiting to pray. Jody's going to take us out with singing, If Not For Grace. True. 
storms of life, a shield surrounding me. Oh, I thank you for the mercy you provided. Yes, you have. Oh, I know you could have walked away, but you stayed a thousand times. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Oh, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Yes, I am a hopeless case. you thankful. 